This locomotive was out chopped by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in March of 1921. Uh, there was an order of I believe 14 or 15 of these built at that time. The engine went into service in April of 1921. It remained in service constantly until January of 1957. It was one of the last engines to operate in the San Francisco San Jose commute service. From 1921, when it went into service until in the late 20s, these were the premier passenger locomotive on the Southern Pacific, handling all of the great name trains. And this engine operated for a long while on the Overland Limited and trains like that between Sparks, Nevada and Ogden, Utah, which is 535 miles. At that time, it was the longest unassisted run by any locomotive in the United States. At that time, the Southern Pacific uh, bought 10 mountain-type locomotives. Very, looked very similar to this, except they had one more driver. They had eight drivers instead of six. But they had a bigger cylinder and they were capable of doing much heavier work. These engines at that time were downgraded somewhat to handling the mail trains and a more secondary type of trains uh, over the system. And uh, then when uh, World War II started, uh, in the 40s, even when uh, America started building up, these engines again went back to working very, very hard. Uh, all through the war, these engines were handling uh, 12 and 14 Pullman cars full of military personnel uh, at, at high speeds, and uh, uh, they were once again a real mainline locomotive. With the close of World War II, the Peninsula Commute Service here between San Francisco and San Jose was building up. Uh, suburbia had started. People were living out of town and commuting. And the commute, uh, the commute traffic had gotten up to, I believe, around 20,000 a day. And uh, these engines, once again, were pulling uh, 10, 11, and even 12 car commuter trains on the peninsula. Uh, as the bigger engines were released, uh, the passenger traffic dwindled on the main line. The passenger trains were discontinued. Bigger engines became available for the commute service and uh, many of the lighter Pacific class locomotives, that's what this is called, the Pacific class, were junked uh, in the early 50s, and these engines uh, gradually slipped down to where they were working the lighter uh, two or three car midday and late night local, which is where this engine ended up. I want to make sure the steam vent is open. I can see the steam coming out of it. So I know there's steam in the boiler, at the same time, I don't want steam going into the cylinder so the engine doesn't move. All right, I'm gonna go up, I'm gonna remove the stack cover, then I'm gonna walk down the top and I'm gonna turn on the turret valve to make sure I get steam from the boiler into my manifold, into the fireman's manifold. Now, before I go into the cab, I'm gonna walk around the engine to see if there's any chains or blocks or anything of that sort under the wheel. Make sure there's, there isn't anything under there that I don't know about before we move it. That looks pretty good. Like the old fellow says, the drop on the machinery is worth a whole can on the ground. But that's generally where it ends up. But lubrication is very important because oil is really very cheap compared to manufacturing new parts and uh, the engine failing out on the road due to hot pins, uh, driving boxes, etc. The driving wheels are all equipped with a grease cake, what we call a grease cake lubricator under there. And that is what the stars on the center of the wheels designate. Everybody thought Southern Pacific did that to pretty them up. Not true. It meant that the engine was equipped with grease pad lubricators. What it is, is a pad made of grease. Uh, it's held by a metal container. It's shaped to fit the bottom of the axle. There's springs underneath it which keep it pushed up against the bottom of the axle like this. So that it's leaking. This is what I told you about a can on the ground. Anyway, as the axle turns in here, this 
simply rubs on it and the axle is constantly picking up a slight amount, small amount of grease. That's how they're lubricated. This is a trailing wheel. One axle, there's 47,000 pounds resting on these two wheels. And inside here is the bearing for this. Uh, this is the axle, and this is the bearing. This is what we call a flat back bearing. You can see right around here is the, is the white, what we call white metal or babbit. And this axle rotates in it. Down in the bottom here is a pad that rubs on the bottom of the axle. And you can look through the little window here and you see that's full of oil. So that means there's proper lubrication in there. The valve motion here, which are, is all of this, all of this. These are all grease fittings here and we use a kind of a graphited type of grease uh, which holds up, it's very very good lubricant. Uh, we don't need the real heavy grease there because we do not have the pressure or the movement that we have on these bearings here. These bearings here are going a full circle. Most of these bearings here are simply rocking type of thing. There's not a heck of a lot of movement there. And uh, that graphite type of grease holds up very well. Now, there's a lot of oil. Lots of things to oil on here. The cylinders and the valve, this is the valve up here and this is the cylinder. 25 by 30. This has a nine inch diameter valve in here which is shaped like a spool. And uh, I'll show you in a moment, this valve motion here moves that back and forth. At 75 miles an hour, this locomotive is making about 350 revolutions per minute, which means that this piston in here, this piston and this rod has to weigh at least 1,000 pounds. This thing is starting here, goes back here, and goes back here uh, about six times per second, which would produce about 350 RPM on the engine, which means the valve has to admit steam here to push the piston back, then it has to exhaust it, then it has to admit steam here to push the, this piston back, then it has to exhaust, it has to do that six times a second. That probably doesn't sound too exciting uh, to people that are into high tech, but when you stop to consider the weight involved, the rough service, and the volumes involved, uh, it's really quite remarkable. This is a force feed or a mechanical lubricator. This is a six feed lubricator, and the lines are here coming off the back of it. What we have up here are four lines. One of these goes to the valve, and one of them goes to the cylinder. Same on the other side. The other two lines, one here goes down to here and lubricates the bottom of the top guide here. This, you have to remember, is flying back and forth at a very high rate of speed, plus there is a lot of pressure on this. Now, oiling. Oiling, there's lots of oiling. Lots of oiling. Uh, for instance, the lower guide here, you see this stuff in here? We put some oil in here, you see. The waste in here holds the oil and lets it dribble out over a prolonged period of time. So you have one in the front and one in the back here. That oils your bottom guide. If you're going to oil around too, pay to put some on here like this. When you are oily, you are looking. And you would be surprised. You find loose bolts, uh, keys out of pins, all kinds of things like that. So that is another reason to be oily. The uh, railroad wanted you to get down and oil every time you stopped for water. And it was amazing. Uh, guys would find defects that before they turned into an accident. Now, the rods, the main rod, 
the side rods, and all that. We use a very heavy pin grease. It's about like a very, very stiff modeling clay. And uh, it holds up very well under high pressure and heat. It's getting low on steam and we have to get this baby going. So I guess the first procedure is, uh, first thing we do is we uh, check the water. Get the uh, water out of the bottom one and to get steam out of the top one, which we have. That means that the uh, gauge is properly uh, adjusted. And the middle one should also get water. Yeah, right. OK, I guess the next thing to do is we're going to have to open the damper, the back damper, that uh, gives us air into the firebox. Uh, we're going to have to uh, open the uh, oil valve up here. OK. We have a good supply of water in the uh, tender, so we're all right there. All right, now we have to open the manifold to get steam to every, all of the valves and everything. Okay. And we want to blow out the atomizer, make sure we have no, uh, get the water out of that. Crack the, uh, the blower about a quarter turn, get some draft going. So we get a little draft through the firebox. Yeah, you can feel it. it's starting to suck now. Get some oil on this waste so it'll burn for me. Got to get it in the center this time. All right. There it's taken. You can see it's starting to flare up inside. When you open this firing valve, you do it one notch at a time. You keep your finger right next to it so that you can feel it when it opens up that one notch, because one notch affects the fire considerably. I'll close the door now. Okay. Looking pretty good. Just have to let her warm up now. Oh, what do you say, Neil? What time is it, sir? All right, you about right? That yeah, looks, that pretty, looks good. pretty good. All right. Okay. All right. <sighs> How you doing, Ron? Well, pretty good. How's she look? It's coming together. 70 pounds, okay. Yeah, I'll take a check. All right, looks good. Pick up and give it a... You got it, Ron. 719 gallons, Neil. 719. And about a little over three quarter tank of water. Okay. Took a little look in here. Yeah, better check it out. See if anything's falling apart. Was okay? Yeah, good and dry, nice and dry. All right, good. Give her a kick in the pants a little bit and see if we can get some steam up. Okay. Well. I started firing in 1951. I was just a young kid right out of high school. I went over to the Southern Pacific on the Coast Division here in, in, uh, in June of 51. And then I went through a series of student fireman trip, firing trips, uh, a lot of yard work. I think we were... Neil and I were kind of figuring out about six, seven hundred hours of yard work before we even got out on the main line. But anyway, we were, in those days, we wanted to make our, as they call it, we make our date, our first actual firing job by ourselves. That was our seniority date. So we tried to get that in as quick as possible so we would get as much seniority as we possibly could. And so it was like eight on and eight off. You know, we'd work a shift and we'd go home and sleep a while and come right back and work another shift. Just got it in as quick as we could. And uh, I made my date. I started around, I was graduated June the 6th, and I was probably uh, in the SP hospital going through a physicals and that sort of thing and, and examinations and so forth uh, around the 10th of June, and I made my date October the 4th. So it was quite an extensive program, and uh, this was with no time off, just like eight on, eight off, just working all the time. And uh, what prompted me to go to the SP is I just was always in love with steam. I mean, I, as a kid, I just loved to watch these things go by, and, and uh, it was always my dream to fire 
the fire steam engines and be in the engine crew and eventually be an engineer. What we got here on the fireman's side of this road engine is, first of all, this is the manifold valve. It allows steam from the turret down this line here into my manifold, which is basically broken up into other various valves for controlling the fire. This gauge up here, this valve here is the water glass, or the upper valve to the water glass, which gives you, allows the water, or the steam part of the boiler, to come on down into the top of the water glass. This is the valve for the bottom, it allows it to come up, and this is also the drain valve. Now when we open this drain valve, the steam pressure in the boiler will war blow the water out, you'll hear that, and then it should come back if everything is working normally. All right, now the water does come back in the gauge, so I know this gauge is operating pretty well. All right, now we get down to the actual firing of the engine. This, of course, is the firebox. This is the firebox door, and I'll give you a little picture of the fire. We'll open it. And we've got a little fire rolling in there right now. This is the peep pole, and we, we cut it down a little bit just so I can see the color of the fire from where I'm sitting. Now, this is the firing valve. This is the firing pin, which is used to control, to set your spot fire and actually control the movement of the valve so you don't put your fire up by shutting the oil up too quickly. This is the quadrant here. You can see a lot of little teeth on here. And uh, we actually fire the engine by moving the firing valve a notch at a time, basically. They call that walking the valve. We've got two brass valves here. One's a water valve and one's a steam valve. This is our injector. This is the second way we get water into the boiler. This is the way we'll use while we're not working steam. Feed water pump is basically the same way except it's a heating pump. And you work this when you're working steam in the engine. So in other words, if the engineer's got the throttle open and we're going down the main line and we have the blower off because we have enough draft going through the firebox by the simple exhausting of the locomotive, then we can crack the water pump and we can operate off of here. This is by far much more efficient. It heats the water much better, gets a little hotter than the injector, and you don't lose any water. Everything is kind of a closed circuit. Pump it right into the boiler. As long as this gauge is moving back and forth, you know your pump is operating. Okay. This gauge is the steam heat, and of course the old cars, we were, we were equipped here with this boiler to steam heat the coaches. And uh, basically, we would give 10 pounds of steam heat per each coach with a minimum of 50 pounds. This engine fires and, and works on 210 pounds of steam pressure. This is my gauge here. The engineer also has one on his side, as well as a water glass. Now, the only other valve that I haven't, that I see I've missed here, if you, I don't know if you can see it or not, but back here is the, it's a blowdown valve. And what it does, it blows, when we start to move the locomotive early in the morning, we get a lot of sediment that's been built up in the boiler and it settles to the bottom of the, uh, of the mud ring. It's a lower part. This valve is located in the lower part of the boiler, so all the sediment sits there. And then we give this boiler a little blow, and I'll pull this valve back, and that'll, that'll blow off the uh, sediment and uh, the impurities in the boiler. It tends to keep it clean. I started out in 1944 in the uh, roundhouse at San Jose and then uh, went out on the road firing and was promoted to locomotive engineer in 1954. And uh, I had the good fortune to fire and run this locomotive uh, when it was in daily service. Now, John has told you what was required uh, becoming a fireman. Uh, a locomotive engineer on steam now this, this, very, this, this is not true today, but during John's time and my time on steam, it was required that you had three years of firing experience before you were even eligible for promotion to locomotive engineer, which required a physical examination. Then uh, uh, we took two written examinations. One mechanical examination, which was about, if I remember right, about 390 questions and answers. It generally took two days to do it. 
Uh, about a week later, you went back and did the Book of Rules examination, which I believe was around 600 questions. And uh, depending on how smart you were and how fast you could write, it took one long day or, or two more days to do that. After you were promoted, uh, you had to have uh, 680 days on the road before you were qualified for patent train service. And uh, after that, well, that was it. But uh, it's not something that happened in a year or two or three. I, I fired 10 years and uh, before I was promoted. Uh, it wasn't uh, that I couldn't have been promoted earlier, it was that I wasn't needed as an engineer. It's a seniority deal, and uh, it depended on uh, how badly they needed men. There's a lot of things over here to look at, and it looks very complex. Actually, it's not really that complex. The main thing with the steam engine is maintaining a safe water level in the boiler at all times. Uh, this engine is equipped with five fusible plugs, We're, we call them sock plugs, and uh, if the water gets too low, uh, before any of the metal sheets are burned, the crown sheet, which is the top sheet in the boiler, and it basically runs right below this row of plugs here. These plugs could be removed to get in and wash the, the uh, crown sheet when we do boiler washing. Uh, actually, when the water is at the bottom of your water glass here, or over here, you still have about three and a half to four inches of water on top of the crown sheet. That is a safety factor, and uh, it's required. Uh, if the water gets too low, gets down to about only an inch of water on top of the crown sheet, these fusible plugs uh, are held in by a lead solder type of thing, which melts at a predetermined temperature. The plugs will then function, which will blow out the fusible plug, which is about three quarters of an inch in diameter, and the steam and water in the boiler go down into the firebox and extinguish the fire. This prevents overheating of the crown sheet, which could result in a boiler explosion. Uh, actually, everyone seems to be very afraid about boiler explosion. Actually, you consider the number of boiler explosions uh, they ever had, uh, really uh, considering the number of engines and the amount of hours of service, uh, they're really very, very safe. We blow these glasses down quite frequently because they have had experiences where uh, boiler scale, uh, foreign material, one thing or another, getting in here and plugging up the uh, passageway in here and the glass then gives a false reading. So uh, we periodically blow them down, the water goes completely out and then you observe that it comes back up again at approximately the same level that it was at again. Back up to the manifold are certain things here concern me. This valve here turns on the lubricator, the steam. This is a hydrostatic lubricator made by the Nathan Manufacturing Company. It is a three feed lubricator. We're only using two of them. This one, this handle lubricates the water pump and this one here, the air compressor. This works on the theory that oil floats on top of water. What happens, the water comes down here, this is full of oil. Right now, it's full. We have what we call a bullseye here. You can look through here, it's glass here and glass here. In the middle is the oil, this is all full of oil. So to check and see if the lubricator is full, you look through the glass here. If you can't see through the glass, it means it's full because you can't see through the oil. Again, we have a bullseye glass here and I can see all the way through here. All there is in there is water. Now, before, about 15 minutes before starting the water pump or the air compressor, you turn this, and you regulate it, and you look through here and you'll see little drops of oil going up. They go up, 
and out through these lubrication lines here to wherever they're going, the air compressor or the water pump. This holds one of these canfuls here of oil. This can here is full of what we call valve oil, or steam cylinder oil is probably a better name for it. It's a very heavy oil, and it holds up very well under steam and water. Again, I have a steam gauge here, which is calibrated with John. They both read the same, so I can see how he's doing. This is the air gauge. Uh, there is a pipe all the way back through the train called a brake pipe, train line, whatever you want to call it. And that supplies air to the cars and the locomotive for the operation of the air brakes. This, of course, is a throttle, and it has a lot of notches here, as you can see on it. And, uh, of course, the farther out you bring the throttle, why, the more steam uh, you're admitting into the, the valves and the cylinders. Uh, these are the two brake valves. The little one here is an S, uh, Westinghouse S6 valve, and uh, it has five positions uh, over here. Uh, this is where it's normally carried. Uh, this is with the brakes released. This applies the brake on the engine and tender only. Uh, and this is a release position here, and this is where it's normally carried when we're out on the road. Uh, you come up over the hump here, that's what we call lap. You bring it here, it's slow application. It builds the brake cylinder pressure up very slowly. If you're in a hurry, you come over here against the spring, and that's called quick application over there, and it applies the brake more rapidly. This is a lap position. In other words, if you want to bring it over here and put 20 pounds in, and then you put it there, and then it just holds it at 20 pounds. It does not add or subtract. Okay, this is tied in with this. This is the automatic brake valve. This applies the brakes on the cars and the locomotive, and all the way over is emergency. Commonly called big hole on the railroad, simply because it lines the largest port up in the brake valve with the atmosphere and applies the brake at a very rapid rate. <clears throat> this is a sander valve. And this, out in front of the driving wheels, we have some pipes come down from the sand dome, which is up on top of the boiler. When we open this, air goes out to the sand trap and blows sand down the pipes in front of the driving wheels, and uh, it sprinkles it on the rail right ahead of the drivers. Sand increases the adhesion between the wheel and the rail. And, uh, is very helpful in, in starting uh, heavy trains or on uh, slippery rail. Uh, it's also beneficial in braking. Uh, excessive use of the sand is, is not recommended. Uh, some people may remember years ago the little wire running down the middle of all of the cars, and the conductor would reach up there to get a hold of that wire and pull it. Well, what happened? Uh, this little whistle would sound down here. For instance, uh, if you were standing still and the little whistle blew three times, it meant they want to back up. If you were running and the little whistle blew three times, it meant stop at the next station. But we had, uh, we had whistle signals for just about everything. If we didn't have a whistle signal, we had hand signals. It was really a wonderful way to work. It's almost a lost art today. Uh, you see very few hand signals anymore. Uh, you see him going around with a light locomotive, and one guy is talking to the engineer over the radio, and he's 40 feet away. But uh, it was really, uh, it was really a very nice way to work. It was, a, it was really an art to uh, to watch uh, some of the people on the ground, switchmen, brakemen, conductors. Uh, we could work all day and never speak a word. We had uh, signs for everything. This little gem here is a power reverse gear, forward over here and back. Uh, we don't have air yet, uh, so uh, I'll, we will see how this works later on. Uh, on many older engines, they called it a Johnson bar. And it was a manually operated reverse thing and had a big old reverse lever. Looked something like this, only it was about four, four feet tall, sometimes five feet tall. 
and uh, you had to get up and then wrestle this thing around and probably end up with a double hernia and uh, broken back and a few other things. Later on, the Interstate Commerce Commission said any locomotive weigh over 150,000 pounds on the driving wheels had to be equipped with a power reverse gear. Up here, this handle here goes outside to a throttle valve out there, and this is steam to the cylinder cock. Uh, these cylinders are 25 inches in diameter, and the piston has a 30-inch stroke. That's quite a large cylinder. Uh, yet, there's very little clearance uh, on the heads. There's probably only a, a, perhaps a quarter of an inch clearance, and water doesn't compress. So if you get a lot of water in there and the piston comes forward, uh, it can actually blow the head right off the cylinder. That you don't want. Another big, lots of trouble, and the, the mechanical department just love you for doing things like that. Plus the fact the engine will probably be out of service for several days while they do it. When we get going, why then we turn this and they close. You don't want them open all the time because they waste a lot of steam and you lose power and it keeps everybody awake. It's the kind of job that you have to, you have, to have a disposition for paying attention to what you're doing. You, you can't really drift too much, particularly like on the spot here you can a little and talk and whatever, but when you're actually out on the road and you're working, you're, you're really managing your steam pressure, you're watching your water, and, and you're very busy. And there's a lot to do. You're the left eye of the engineer. Uh, he can't see much if you're going, or he can't see anything if you're going around a left-hand turn. And uh, if you're going uh, as far as, if you look down the locomotive, uh, you're pretty well blind about 30, 40 yards in. You can't see much in front of the locomotive that close in. So essentially what you're doing is uh, you've got to have an attitude where you're, uh, uh, where you pay attention to what you're doing. You can't kind of drift because once the steam starts to get away from you, it takes quite a bit to get it back. If the steam starts to drop, you have to start walking your valve one notch here and making various adjustments. Uh, a steam locomotive doesn't, they all, basically they fire the same, but they, all engines have different characteristics. So in a sense, they fire different. And even though they may be the same class of locomotive, they have different characteristics. So you just have to watch your water when it starts, and you have to manage that water supply. If you're working full throttle, you're carrying about maybe two thirds to three quarters of a glass. Uh, when the engineer's going to shut off, the water level is going to drop a little bit, and you kind of have to prepare that so when he starts up again, you've got enough water in it and you can keep your steam on the point. When, when he needs the steam, he needs it when he's working the engine. When he starts out and he works a hard throttle, that's when he wants his 210 pounds. Well, the teamwork is, <laughs> it's for some verbal. Uh, a lot of it, if we're calling signals, we'll, we'll use the air valve kind of saves the voice a little bit, or we'll call out a green and he'll wave to me in, in response and vice versa. So we communicate the signals, that's number one, to know the track is clear. The, uh, my communication with the engineer is I watch him. So, so as I'm going down the road, I'd be in this position here looking out the window. I'm looking at my steam gauge, I'm looking at my water, and I've got my eye on him and the throttle. Is I'm supplying power for the engineer. He's got to have steam pressure, and I've got to make sure the boiler is safe so she has plenty of water in her. You can't make steam without water, and uh, you don't want to run low water in any of these in any of these types of boilers. Well, a clean stack tells me that the fire is burning efficiently. If I wanted to get maximum heat out of the oil I've got in there, then I would be burning a light brown haze. And if you can't do it with a light brown haze, why then you've probably got something wrong, and it's something you have to look into. Either the fire is out of adjustment, or you've got a dirty flue. Your, fire, or your, steam, your boiler's not steaming as well as it should. The first thing, of course, is that you have to know that it's safe to move the locomotive. Right now, we have our blue flag up here. The engine is not to be moved under any circumstances, not to be coupled onto by another locomotive or cars. And this is a safeguard for people working on and about the locomotive, and it is to be respected at all times. The person putting this flag up is the person that takes it down. And when he takes it down, it's his responsibility to know that it is safe to move the locomotive. You've got to look around, make sure that the chains are out from underneath the locomotive. You have to make sure 
that the brakes are applied on the locomotive and the tender. As a matter of fact, you do that before you take the chains out so that the engine does not roll away on you or there's any kind of an uncontrolled movement. After you've walked around and ascertained that it's safe to move, uh, you do that. Fine. To do that, you move the reverse lever all the way into the forward position. You release the locomotive brake and you open the throttle uh, gently. None of this jerking around. These things do not react like a gasoline engine or an electric motor. You have to give them time. You open this, you can watch your steam chest pressure will gradually start building up. This engine will generally move on about 60 pounds of steam chest pressure. Then, of course, the speed is simply regulated by how much, how much throttle you give it. Uh, you move for quite some distance with the sonar cocks open, allowing the water to work out of the valves and the pistons as they're going back and forth out there. Basically, what we're doing here, if the engineer was going to move the locomotive light, my major concern would be that the fire stays lit when we're drifting. So I would try to keep the fire bright, and uh, he's not going to work enough throttle where I'm going to have to really make some radical changes, but I may need a notch or two just to keep the fire lit while he's exhausting. Back up, so we'll ring the bell a little bit. Here we go, back up. All right, back up. Now, as the engine starts exhausting, I'm just going to try to keep the fire. I'm looking at it through the peephole there. Keep it from going out. Keep a bright color in it. And at the same time, we'll try to maintain our steam pressure a little bit. And we'll look back out the window here to see where we're going. About two and a half car lengths, uh, Neil. Okay. Now you got about two. All right. You got about one now, Neil. One. back down and couple onto the train. At that time, uh, the carman would couple up the air hose between the tender and the, and the cars and cut in the air. The brake pipe pressure would drop. The pump would go to work. And you sit here and pump on them until in freight, 90 pounds, passenger 110, get the desired pressure up, the brakes are charged. Well, I guess we're all ready to start ahead, so First thing we'll do is see if we can get a sign from our brakeman on the rear end. Okay, so it's all right to go, so put the engine into forward motion. We'll release the uh, engine brake and open the throttle. And hopefully, why, uh, here in a minute, we'll go. Headlight, little bell. Now throttle's open, we'll open the We'll walk the firing valve here a couple of notches to keep it in there. If I hear the engine start to slip, and I'm going to give it enough oil so the fire, so he doesn't draw my fire out and put the fire out. If the engine kind of recovers and starts to grip the tracks again, he's going to widen out on it again. Then I will graduate my firing valve. Now, assuming now the engine's not going to slip anymore and it's just starting to take the load, we know you can tell a couple of good exhausts, and you know when you have it, you got that feel for it. What I'm going to do is that the engine starts to chug maybe three, four, five times. I'm going to walk the valve up and keep that pressure right at 210. But I'm going to have about five or six notches here that I can play with the oil valve before I have a maximum fire. And in order for me to determine that, I have to look out the stack or look through this window at the stack. When I see a light brown haze coming out of the stack, then I know I've 
achieve my, my own personal maximum fire. Once we get out, we get the train moving. Well, we get out on the main line and we chug, chug, chug along. Yard tracks out of yards and things, five, 10 miles an hour, depending on the railroad and what they We get out on the main line, why uh, we're gonna go, let's say 60 mile an hour speed limit, why you would just gradually move the throttle on out until you're all the way out here with it. By this time, we'll probably have 190 pounds. Normally, on a road running along at good speed, uh, the back pressure should be around five, six pounds. As the speed starts increasing, you start notching up. As you notice, the quadrant here has 50, 60 feet on it. Here. What you're doing is shortening the valve travel out there, which means that the valve cuts the steam off to the cylinder at an earlier time. With the, with the reverse lever all the way down, this engine is probably getting steam in the cylinder for about 70% of the stroke, for 21 inches, at which time the valve would cut the steam off. Uh, at very high speeds with this engine, you're probably admitting steam only to about 10% of the stroke. You're probably only admitting steam for about the first three or four inches of the stroke. The rest of it is all done by expansion. That's one of the most wonderful things that the steam engine had going for itself, was the expansive power of the steam. The proper handling of the reverse lever is very, very important. It's really best and the most efficient if you can operate the locomotive with the throttle wide open because the steam at very high pressure in here has more expansive power and therefore is more efficient. On a long run passenger train like the Daylight or the Lark, you're going along 70 miles an hour and you want to stop at, we'll say, Selena. The first thing you would do is probably make a reduction here. Now this is going to make a little bit of noise, so hold on. Now you reduce the brake pipe by 10 pounds. Back on the cars, you get two and a half times the 10, which means in the brake cylinders on the coaches and the, and the sleeping cars back there now, you have 25 pounds per square inch in the brake cylinders back there. That'll do quite a little bit of work. Now, we always kept the engine brake released. As you can see here, the engine brake has come on now to 25 pounds, and that you don't want. So, this has a return spring in here, and you go over against that, you have to hold it there. The pressure will drop. Well, now the engine brake is released, but you still got the train brake on. And now, okay, at this time, now you would start to gradually close the throttle. You'd get it down a ways, and uh, it would be good to uh, to drop the reverse lever down some. Then you know you, you you've got to you got to kind of play it by ears, like making a three-point landing. You have to feel your way in. You have to have a feeling, uh, hey, is the thing slowing down fast enough? Are we gonna get stopped at the depot? Or are we gonna go by? If we're gonna go by, hey, fine, we're gonna have to make another reduction and uh, put the brakes on harder back on the car. Now we have a 20 pound reduction. You have about 40, uh, about 50 pounds of brake cylinder pressure in the coaches, which is probably as high as you'd wanna go. And uh, so, you keep throttling down and keep dropping the reverse lever down. The idea is when you come into the station, you just barely got the throttle open. This may be showing 15, 20 pounds steam chest pressure. Engine brake release like this. And then when you get down to your spot, now if you're about to take water, you had to be very careful. Because if you got by the water spot, the only thing you could do was back up. That's kind of hard to do because when you stop with a passenger train, people are getting on and off and one thing or another, so you just can't back up. So the best thing to do is come in very cautiously on a passenger train, especially if you had to take water, and uh, be sure and hit the spot. This tank does have three manholes up there on it, so you have, a, you have about a 15 foot leeway there. Uh, but you've gotta, you're gonna have to stop within about a 15 foot stretch. We had marks on the ground, we called them water marks, and uh, you wanted those right underneath the cab window. And if you did that, that meant you were properly spotted for water so the fireman could go up and take water. 
The idea is when you come to a stop on passenger cars, the brakes can be graduated off. And the idea is, like your automobile, you come up to a stoplight, you're going 50 miles an hour, you have to press down fairly hard on the brake pedal of your car. As the speed gets down and you come up to the light, whether you realize it or not, you're letting up, letting pressure off of the brake pedal so you don't throw yourself through the windshield when you stop. Passenger train, you have to remember there are people back there walking around, eating dinner in the diner, or if they're lucky, having a highball in the lounge car. And uh, so you have to take that, or at night, people are sleeping. You don't want to wake them up. So uh, we would come in then, and, and as the speed decreased, as the speed decreases on anything, the braking force increases. So what we would do is you'd come in like this, and you see it come back up a little bit. Well, what you're doing back there is you're, the, 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 the graduating valves on the cars will allow some of the brake cylinder pressure to escape to the atmosphere, thereby cutting down pressure in the brake cylinder. The ideal thing to do was to come to a stop with the throttle shut off, reverse lever in the corner, and just as you come to a stop, you'd release it like that, and of course the brakes don't let go that fast. They, re they release through a retaining valve which has a choke in it, and it would take the brakes uh, maybe 15 or 20 seconds to completely release on the car. The ideal way, and what everyone strived for, was to come to a stop, the throttle shut off, reverse lever down here, and the last whisper of air coming out of the retaining valves on the cars to make a nice smooth stop. Okay, now as we're rolling into the depot, you gotta remember, I have, I have no blower on, I have a full turn of atomizer and this engine three quarter full turn, good bright fire. I have a water pump that's working. And I have, I've kind of graduated my water up a little bit. Now, when the engineer goes to the automatic train brake, I hear it. So I know that he's gonna make some adjustments over there to, to plan his stop. Well, I've got a plan for him. So now the first thing I do is I'll turn the, the first of all, I'm gonna turn the blower on where I normally would turn it, in this case about a half a turn, because that would keep a pretty good fire in like what I have here. I'm gonna come back on my atomizer about quarter turn, and I'm gonna shut my pump off. Now I've already added enough water, and if I haven't, then I need more water, I'll go to the injector to do that so I don't chill the boiler. So I'll shut the pump off, have the blower on, have this off. Now I'm ready for him to shut the throttle when he wants to. I'm graduating down on steam pressure, maybe five or six pounds, depending on how long we're gonna stay there. And I'll, as he's working his way into the depot, he's gonna start easing down. As he eases down, I'm already prepared here. I've got a draft going through the firebox. Anyway, I don't need his exhaust for the draft. So I will just walk my valve down to where I have it set on the firing pin as he shuts off. It makes a nice, smooth transition. Normally, my steam pressure, if it's back about five or six pounds, it'll start climbing once I get into the depot. If I've done it right, the water will drop to the level I want it at when we start. As we stop into the depot, we're there three or four minutes, the steam pressure will continue to work up, and when he gets the highball to move out again, I've got my 210 pounds, I've got my water where I want it, and I simply reverse the procedure that I indicated before, shutting off as he opens the throttle up. So you're kind of planning this stop to stop. I always like about 100 feet before I was going to come to a stop, I would put the sanders on. That way when you stop, the locomotive was sitting on sand. Now when you get ready to leave, put that down and you could go right at them, put the sand on, and the engine won't slip because it's already sitting on sand. If you come in and stop and then try to leave and the engine wants to slip, well it has to move about 30 feet before you get all of the wheels on the sand. So if you put the sand on maybe a car length or so before you stop, when you stop the engine's already sitting on sand, now you're ready to go without slipping the wheels. 